we look at the internal factors and not just the external factors, and we have to understand that the greatest battle, like I was saying before, is in our mind. A lot of times when things happen and things go wrong, amen, it'll try to divert us or revert us back to things in our past, amen. It'll try to take us back to our past abandonment. It'll try to take us back, back to our past depression. It'll try to take us back to our past, you know, um, abuse, amen, a lot of times. So if the enemy can take us back to our past, amen, he understands that it's even a further, further race for us to get to our future, amen. Everything that comes against us, amen, is strategic in his planning, amen. He's not just having people talk about you just to talk about you. He's trying to lower your self-esteem, amen. He's not having people turn against you that said he was your friend just to turn against you. He wants you to have a sense of abandonment. So we have to understand that everything that the devil is doing is strategic, amen. So we have to be strategic back in our fight against him. We have to be strategic back in our battle and our warfare against him. If we look at any battle in the Bible, uh, when, when God sent forth his people and his, the Israelites to fight, amen, any fight in any battle that he sent, amen, it wasn't a lot of people that he sent. Amen. He just sent a huge army. And a lot, some of the greatest battles in the Bible were fought, were fought by 300 men or were fought by a one woman who, who took the step and said, I'm going to do this for the people of God, amen, and I want to be blessed after I do this. So we have to understand it's not about numbers, but it's about what we do with what we have. Look at you and say, what can you do with what you have? Look at somebody and say, what can you do with what you have? What can you do with what you have? Amen. What we have to understand is that. I have a praise, amen, and nobody can take a praise away from me. You have to understand that I have, I can go home and I can get on my knees and pray, and nobody can take that away from me. So we have to understand the weapons that we have, we have to use. Look at you, say, use your weapons. Use your weapons. So in using our weapons, we have to understand that sometimes our greatest enemy is not the devil. Sometimes the greatest, our greatest enemy is not our uh, our enemy who's talking about us behind our back, but our greatest enemy is the person that we see every day in the mirror. Oh, yeah. Amen. When I wake up and I and I and I see myself in the mirror, what am what am I what am I looking at? Am I telling myself that I'm I'm successful? Am I telling myself that I'm victorious? Am I telling myself that that I that I'm appreciated? Am I telling myself and encouraging myself to be greater, or am I looking at myself and I'm seeing my flaws? Am I looking at myself and I'm seeing the things that I've done wrong? And I'm, and I'm looking back at my past and I'm seeing the things that I have not done right. And then when we look in the mirror, we have to see something that's greater than what we see at the present time. We have to see what we see in the future. We have to see what God sees in us. I talked before, um, appreciate before about the looking glass self. And, uh, and uh, um, sociologists say a lot of times the way we see ourselves is the way we see ourselves through other people. And that's what we see happening with children a lot. Um, I was having, I was talking with somebody else about, um, you know, a, a lot of times if anybody see, follows me on Facebook, you know, I post a lot of stuff, but I really get going when they talk about a lot of stuff that has to do with like black issues and, you know, racism and the different things, you know, the systematic things in our country. And I was talking with somebody, they were saying that a lot of times, um, uh, I, I'm sure everybody's seen that hashtag, uh, Black Lives Matter. Has anybody seen that? All right, so it was somebody who was saying that black lives won't matter to anybody else until they matter to black people. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, that, that's a good point, but you have to understand w w what is the root of that issue? What is the root of why there's so many game, black gangs out there and there's so many people killing each other? There's so many people fighting against each other. When we know that there's an enemy out there greater than us, but we're fighting against each other. And it's the same way in the church. We come to church and we bicker. We come to church and we sow discord. But we really have to understand that there's a greater enemy who who's not have to, he doesn't have to do anything because we're destroying ourselves. And the pastor never say, don't destroy yourself. And, and I, I was having that discussion with this person, and I, I was explaining to them, and I tried to use the best analogy that I could, and I said, I, and I told them it's like a child growing up. If I if I raise a child in my home, and I tell that child they're not going to be anything, if I tell that child they're stupid, if I tell that child you know they're ignorant, they won't be anything, and they you know everything they do is wrong, and that's going to start tearing down our self esteem, and then therefore they don't see the value within themselves. And I said you have to understand that's the same thing that's happened within this this ethnicity and this group of people. I said for so long they've been told. Hey, Amen, that they're not valued, amen, that they're not equal to others, amen, that they don't have the same rights as others, that they can't do the same things as others, that, you know, they're, they're lower than other people. I said, so when that happens, amen, there's a certain sense of value that is lost, and it's not that person's fault. But what we have to understand is that even when we become uh, victimized, and we have been victimized by abuse, or we've been victimized by abandonment, or we've been victimized by just people who don't care about us, 
there's still a point in our time, still a point in our life, and still a point in our battle where we have to understand that we cannot use that as a crutch. That's right. We cannot use that That's as right. an excuse. I have to understand that no matter what I have been through in my life, no matter what battles I have fought, no matter what battles I have actually lost, because a lot of times those are our greatest things. We look at the things that we've done wrong. Right. We look at the things that we, we you know, when I was trying to do well, I, I fell here and I stumbled that's here. Right. But the Bible says that we all fall short and come short of the glory of God. So that's when, I, when we have to realize that we can't judge another because their shortcomings might not be the same as my shortcomings. Yes. Amen. Amen. Your shortcoming might be because you deal with lust that you might fall and uh, fornicate. But my shortcoming might be that I steal. So when I go to the store, oh, amen, amen, or when I go to on. see that cookie yeah. that's just sitting Break there, I slide that thing in my pocket. Down. Amen. So your shortcomings might not be my shortcomings. But look at somebody say, we all have our shortcomings. We all have our shortcomings. Look at somebody say, we all have, we all have fallen. Everybody. And as I was saying, um, I was talking to this person about, you know, this, the, 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 the impact of self-esteem and value, amen, that not only takes place within an uh, individual, but it takes place within communities and large groups and environments, amen. Um, it can even happen when I worked in, you know, certain classrooms in the school, amen. If a teacher is not one that is trying to encourage students or she's not one that's trying to uplift students or build, build students, amen, or tell them that they can do better and they're just there just to get a paycheck, amen, you'll see a certain uh, environment in that classroom. You'll see a certain climate in that classroom. Classroom. I mean, those students are not going to come wanting to learn. Those students are not going to come wanting to, you know, do better and get better. And you even see those things in certain churches. Amen. You got certain churches that have a certain climate, and they care, and they they push certain things. I mean, you got churches that preach money. And right. so when they come to church, everybody got money, everybody's giving money to offer, but nobody's got any deliverance. Nothing. Nobody's got any healing. You got churches that preach, you know, uh, hey, amen, we're going to come and we're going to just, uh, you know, uh, adore God and lift him up and just worship, amen. Oh, 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 and and, and, I, and I don't, I don't, I'm not tearing down worship, but uh, we got a lot of churches that downplay praise and talk about how much we need to worship God because there's this, um, there's this misconception that if I'm worshiping God, that means I have a greater level of intimacy with him. Yeah. That if I'm praising him, amen, we, we come to church and we get saved and we see people get a breakthrough. And what's the first thing we see them do? They start crying, they start shouting, they start praising, amen. Right. But it's been a misconception and told in with people behind this pulpit that if we if we come to church and I have this great relationship and I have this deep uh, revelation of God, amen, that I'm beyond praise. I, uh, that I'm going to worship him. That I don't, I don't have to go out there and shuffle my feet. I don't have to go out there.